Uh, so thank you for inviting me to be here today to talk about advancements in bladder cancer and research. I want to just let you know that in, in terms of what kind of bladder cancer I'm going to be talking about, most of the research is usually done in the metastatic setting. Uh, and then it's, uh, it's in generally, and then it's taken uh, from the metastatic setting to invasive disease and then to non-invasive disease, although non-invasive disease and invasive disease and metastatic disease are managed differently. Uh, the drugs may be used uh, in, and they may be interchanged, um, but they're first usually studied in the metastatic setting, and that's usually the way that we do research and we uh, test new drugs. So today we're going to discuss cancer genetics and the Cancer Genome Atlas, Applied Cancer Genetics and Other Tumors, Cancer Genetics in Urothelial Cancer, and Advances in Urothelial Cancer. So when we talk about cancer, we're actually talking about over 200 diseases and a lot more subtypes. Cancer is caused by errors of DNA. Let me make sure of this. Okay, I got a pointer. DNA carries the instruction that tells cells what to do. All the DNA in one cell in your body is called the genome. So the human genome is stored in 23 chromosomes in the nucleus of your cell, 23 pairs of chromosomes. And the chromosomes are made up of coiled DNA. So this is DNA here, and which is made up of base pairs, four base pairs to be precise. And in one cell, we have over 6 billion DNA base pairs. So basically, we're just codes that are walking around. We're genetic codes. And every individual has their own different genetic code, although the variations among people are actually not that different. Cancer is caused by changes in DNA base pairs called mutations. These can be deletions, duplications, and or substitutions. And it could be one base pair, it could be multiple base pairs, it could be an entire chromosome that can be either deleted, duplicated, or, or substituted. DNA mutations can be inherited, but most are acquired throughout life. And these are acquired by insults such as smoking, radiation exposure, chemical exposure, infections, and other environmental factors. Bladder cancer, we know, is associated with smoking. Other causes of bladder cancer, and I think that you've discussed these a little bit today already, are uh, aromatic amines, uh, which are occupational hazards, uh, and they're, produ they're produced from the their byproducts of the production of leather, rubber, uh, and paint. Prior pelvic radiation, if you've received pelvic radiation for prostate cancer or for, or for cervical cancer, uh, cyclophosphamide therapy, which is a chemotherapy agent that may be used in rheumatologic diseases too. Schistosomiasis infection, which is a parasitic infection that is endemic in the Nile River Valley in Africa. Chronic cystitis, chronic bladder infections, is also a risk factor. And you can see this in patients that have chronic indwelling catheters or patients that are paraplegic. HNPCC, which stands for hereditary non-polyposis colon cancer, uh, is also associated with the development of urothelial cancer. And uh, this is an inherited disorder uh, that uh, predisposes you not only to colon cancer, but to other cancers, such as endometrial cancer, stomach cancer, small intestine cancer, and urothelial cancer. Now, do, throughout this talk, I'm going to say bladder cancer, I'm going to say urothelial cancer, and when we say bladder cancer, we really mean urothelial cancer. We mean cancer of the, of the urothelial tract, of, of the urinary tract, which can occur anywhere from the kidney, the ureters, to the bladder, to the urethra. However, it's more common to develop the, uh, the tumors in bladder, but they can occur anywhere throughout the urinary tract. And their natural course is actually very similar, and they're managed very similar. So I want to introduce you today to the Cancer Genome Atlas. This is a project, a joint project between the National Cancer Institute and the National Human Genome Research Institute, with the goal to create a genome atlas of human cancers. It hopes to transform our understanding of human cancers and therefore improve cancer prevention, early detection, and treatment. This was a pilot study that was started back in 2006 to identify genomic changes in more than 20 different types of human cancers, including bladder cancer. Thank goodness we were included in this. 
and it compares the DNA in normal tissue and cancer tissue from the same patient, and then it compares it across a really large sample of patients, thousands of patients, to see if uh, uh, they're the same. In 2009, the NIH announced that it was investing $275 million to the, to the Cancer Genome Atlas over the next two years of this five-year project because they see how fruitful it's been so far in terms of uh, giving us more information. So this year at GU ASCO, the Genital Urinary American Society of Clinical Society, uh, Society meeting that we have, our meeting that we have uh, every year, uh, there was much excitement about the possible approval by the FDA for MDV3100, a drug for prostate cancer. This would join a long list of prostate cancer agents that have been approved over the last few years and a long list of agents that have been approved for kidney cancer over the last few years. In total, 12 new agents approved by the FDA for both renal and prostate cancer. And nothing in bladder cancer for over 20 years has been approved by the FDA. There is a true unmet need for better treatments and effective treatments in this disease. And it is really our understanding of cancer biology and the mechanisms of how the, the cells work and the proteins that are expressed in these tumors that has helped us understand more about the pathways and develop therapies for treating renal cancer. And it's, it's understanding of the androgen pathway that has helped us develop uh, more diseases for prostate cancer. So we need, we need to better understand the biology of bladder cancer. So the goal of understanding cancer genetics is to identify cellular pathways that drive the development of cancer, improve the selection of therapeutic targets. We hope to use drugs that actually target mutations instead of just cell types and therefore run more efficient clinical trials. This is a picture of a cell, and we know a lot of pathways now that are activated uh, in my, uh, my pointer is not working. There it goes. That are activated uh, in in cancer, and a lot of proteins that are expressed in cancers. And now we have drugs that can actually target these proteins and these pathways. However, uh, we're still treating most tumors by cell type. Bladder cancer is predominantly a transitional cell type. 90% of bladder tumors are transitional cell carcinoma. But there are other types of cell types, too, for bladder cancer. There's squamous cell carcinoma, adenocarcinoma, small cell carcinoma, and they're all managed differently. Different chemos, different surgeries. The goal would be to not treat uh, cancers by cell, but more by mutations and by their genomic uh, uh, profiles. So right now, we we resect a tumor, we look at it under the microscope, we look at what histology it is, what's the cell type, is it a transitional cell, is it a, is it, is it a lung cancer, is it a melanoma, glioma, and then we treat with a targeted therapy. And then we run a clinical trial and we see very little responses. Most of the patients don't respond. The goal would be to resect the tumor, do a genomic profile of the tumor, see what mutations are present in that tumor, and use targeted therapies for those mutations. So when you run a clinical trial, you'll have more patients responding to the treatment. Now, this is an idealist view because we don't know all the mutations that are present in particular tumors. And Cancer is very smart. It's not just one mutation. In most of the tumors, they have a lot of different pathways and a lot of different mutations that are present. So this is, this is an ideal view, uh, and it's, it's where we're headed right now. And uh, using uh, also uh, more than one agent um, increases toxicity if you're using targeted agents and you're combining them. Uh, so we have to learn about their toxicities and about their safety in order to move forward uh, with this method of therapy. Another goal of cancer genetics is to identify markers of tumor biology, tumor aggressiveness, response to therapy. We, we don't have a PSA yet you know, for bladder cancer, but we're working on it. And uh, this is a great example, Oncotype DX. It's a breast cancer test. It's a genomic test that analyzes the activity of a group of genes that can affect how a cancer is likely to behave and respond to treatment. This is a 21 gene signature so that's taken from the tumor tissue of breast cancer patients. And this is already in practice, in, in, in normal clinical practice. So we, we, 
pa uh, patients are undergoing this test um, uh, in, in general practice right now. And depending on the, on the genetics and the, on the genes, on the group of genes that are activated, you actually get a score. And a low score means that the tumor is less aggressive, so these patients tend to be treated just with hormone therapy. And a high score means that the tumor is more aggressive, and these patients are treated with chemotherapy in addition to the hormone therapy. Now, there's a lot of signatures that have been developed in multiple tumor types, including bladder cancer. And interestingly, the genes that are activated in these signatures are not always the same, but they still have predictive power. Gene signatures, however, need to be tested in really large groups of patients before they can become part of clinical practice. This is just a selective list of some gene signatures that have been published in bladder cancer, and we're still learning about how to use them. Uh, uh, we've learned to uh, predict non uh, uh, the likelihood of progression from a non-invasive tumor to an invasive tumor. Uh, with this signature, these are not in practice yet. These are just reported. Uh, this other uh, signature here uh, can uh, predict the likelihood of lymph node metastases at the time of surgery when a, a patient undergoes a cystectomy. Uh, this other signature can uh, uh, predict the response to neoadjuvant chemotherapy. A coxin model is also being uh, developed where uh, you you, you um, combined uh, the cell line data that we have in terms of response to a chemotherapeutic agent, and we combine that with the tumor biology in terms of the genes that are expressed, and we get a score as to the response to therapy. And all of these are being investigated right now as to how we can use these in clinical practice. Now, I wanted to just talk a little bit about important advances in targeted therapies in cancer and other tumors. Sunit, and there's been a lot of advances, and this is just a very select list. Sunitniv, uh, for example, which is an anti-angiogenic agent, it targets the blood supply of the tumor, has changed the standard of practice of kidney cancer over the last few years. Now therapies have changed from immune therapy to targeted therapies. Imatinib, which is a, uh, my pointer is not working, uh, which targets BCR able has uh, changed uh, chronic myelogenous leukemia, and it was profiled in Time magazine a few years ago as the magic bullet of cancer. And uh, it really is credited for changing this deadly disease into a manageable chronic disease. And other agents uh, have also uh, contributed uh, to uh, the advancements in, uh, in cancer therapy uh, and that are listed here. Uh, one of them is uh, Cipulus OT, which is a, a cancer vaccine for prostate cancer. And uh, this received a lot of press because uh, it's a unique way of, uh, of uh, targeting cancer by, by uh, activating the immune cells. In bladder cancer, there's no specific genetic abnormality that is diagnostic of bladder cancer, but we know there are a lot of mutations that we see with frequency, such as p53, RB, deletions of chromosome 9, overexpression of CRB2, HRAS mutations. And we've accepted that there are two pathways for the development of bladder cancer. There's the low-grade pathway up in the top here, and uh, it's characterized by specific mutations, and the low-grade pathway can, can recur and or can progress to the high-grade pathway, and then there's the high-grade pathway, which are acti actually activated by different mutations. And again, we, we know that there's a high frequency of certain mutations that we see in bladder cancer, but these, uh, we, we still don't have drugs that actually would target these mutations right now. There are drugs that are being developed and uh, that are under uh, study for some of these uh, mutations, uh, but they're still under clinical investigation. However, we, we do know that, uh, m m that many of these pathways um, are active in urothelial cancer, and we do have drugs uh, for these pathways, and they're under investigation. One of the exciting uh, areas in bladder cancer right now are antiangiogenic agents, or drugs that target the blood supply of the tumor. We know that vascular endothelial growth factor, or VEGF, as you have, may, have, may have heard it uh, been called, uh, is increased in the tissue, in the blood, and in the urine of patients with bladder cancer. Therefore, there's a rationale that this may be a target 
for uh, the treatment of bladder cancer, and we were using antiangiogenic agents, and they work in other solid tumors, such as kidney cancer, um, and in combination with chemotherapy in, in other cancers, such as breast, colon, lung, um, and many more. So this is a very important website for you to know, clinicaltrials.gov. It's a website that, that lists all of the open trials that are currently ongoing for every tumor type uh, uh, everywhere. That's basically that's open in any academic institute. And it's in, in, in your slide packet. But it's uh, play with it, um, go to the website, and, and see what's available. And if you, you, you go to bladder cancer, you'll see that there's a lot of targeted agents that are currently being studied, either alone or in combination with chemotherapy, the majority of which are anti-angiogenic agents. Also, another target that we're looking at is uh, EGFR. And more recently, we're actually looking at immune therapy. How can we activate the immune system uh, to target the tumor uh, by using vaccines or just stimulators of the immune system? Uh, PARP inhibitors are also being looked at, proteasome inhibitors, FGFR3, uh, and tubulin. And this is a list of targeted therapies that have already been studied in bladder cancer, either in the first-line setting, and when I say first-line, means newly diagnosed metastatic disease without any prior treatment, or second-line, which is they've already received some, some kind of chemotherapy or multiple lines of chemotherapy. And uh, unfortunately, uh, the response rates are low. This is out of 100, so these are the percentage of patients that respond. Um, and we know these, these drugs work in other solid tumors, but it highlights our need to understand more the biology of what is going on in bladder cancer in order to use drugs that will actually target the tumor. Uh, briefly, I'll mention a few drugs uh, that are being studied right now in bladder cancer. And again, this is all in the metastatic setting. Avastin is one of these drugs, or bevacizumide, and it's a humanized monoclonal antibody that targets VEGF. And it's, uh, it's already FDA approved for kidney cancer in combination with uh, um, chemotherapy, colon cancer, lung cancer, and many other cancers. This is a phase two study, and when I, when I say a phase two study, it means it's usually a small study, 40 to 50 patients, everybody gets the drug uh, that studied the combination of standard chemotherapy, gemcitabine and cisplatinum in the first line setting, combined with bevacizumide or Avastin. And it actually showed promising response rate, which is complete response and partial response from what we know uh, from standard uh, controls. Um, standardly, if you just give the chemotherapy, response rates range from 50 to 60 percent. So 72 percent is actually pretty promising. However, you know, when you do a phase two trial and you don't have an arm with a placebo, you don't really know the benefit that the drug is giving uh, uh, toward uh, treating uh, that tumor. And that that's why now we have a phase three trial that was designed to enroll 500 patients where they're randomized. And uh, they're randomized by a computer to either arm A or arm B to receive standard chemotherapy or standard chemotherapy plus the Avastin. And this way we will know, if we, we compare the differences between these two groups, if there was actually a benefit to giving the drug. Um, and, and Avastin has been studied also in the invasive setting in patients that are undergoing uh, definitive cystectomy. And this was just presented this year at GU ASCO, and it was found to be safe. Um, and uh, when I was at Memorial Sloan Kettering, we also studied Avastin in patients with renal insufficiency. Instead of using cisplatinum, you, we used carboplatinum in combination uh, with Avastin. Um, and so moving on to sunitinib, I don't want to uh, spend too much time on, a, on, on every single um, study, but uh, sunitinib is another anti-angiogenic agent. It's a pill, and uh, it's the pill that, that I was mentioning earlier that changed the standard of care of kidney cancer. And there's a rationale to using it because it's an anti-VEGF. It targets VEGF, and we know that VEGF is overexpressed. The protein of androgenesis is overexpressed in bladder tumors. Um, but unfortunately, the, the, the phase two that was done in the first line setting uh, yielded discouraging results. So here, the survival was, was low uh, compared to what we know it is with standard chemotherapy. 
It was also studied uh, in the second line. So these are patients that already received chemotherapy or other treatments for metastatic disease. And this is um, a waterfall plot, and every, every bar is a patient. And um, if the bar is going down, that means the tumor is shrinking. So we did see some tumor shrinkage. These are two different cohorts with two different dosages with, with sunitinib. So that's encouraging. It was recently reported uh, this year at our, our at yearly meeting uh, in the maintenance setting, sunitinib. And this was a randomized study uh, for patients that have completed the first line uh, uh, chemotherapy. And, and, and usually we, we only treat for a certain number of cycles because of toxicity. And then afterwards we observe. And during that observation period, patients were offered, well, you can just be observed, you can go on the placebo arm, um, you can go on the study, you can just be observed, or you can go on the study and possibly receive sunitinib. Now, this was a randomized study, so half of the patients received sunitinib and half of them didn't. Um, and the study uh, actually, unfortunately, did not show an improvement to giving sunitinib during this observation period versus just doing nothing. So that was a little discouraging. The study was uh, designed to enroll 84 patients and only 54 patients were randomized after the study was open for many years. And it just highlights the, uh, the, the issues that come up with clinical trials in bladder cancer is these trials are designed, the, the, we have uh, these drugs that we want to study, and um, then we don't accrue. And this is a multifactorial issue of why this doesn't happen. A lot of patients that are diagnosed with bladder cancer tend to be older, and have other medical problems that don't make them eligible to be enrolled in a study. And uh, I think another issue is awareness. I think there's a lack of awareness of the community about the clinical trials that are out there. And I think that's why these seminars are very important to make people aware that there are other options out there besides standard of care. And if you can get yourself on a clinical trial, you should. Because, stand because clinical trials give you standard of care and they give you something novel something different, something that, 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 that is cutting edge, uh, that uh, we're very interested in and looks very promising. Uh, Herceptin is some, another agent that was studied also uh, in bladder cancer, and um, it uh, targets the monoclonal antibody that targets a HER2 receptor. It's mostly used in breast cancer, but now we find out that HER2 receptor is also present in other cancers. And in this phase two study where, where trastuzumab or Herceptin was combined with chemotherapy, we found that 50% of bladder tumors are expressing HER2 new. So, you know, this, this may be a potential target for therapies in the future. And the, the final findings in this study, and this, again, was a single-arm study, so we can't really appreciate the benefit of the drug uh, versus the benefit of the chemotherapy. That's why we need randomized studies. And I'm just going to briefly mention other novel therapies that I'm interested in at the NCI. I'm, I'm head of the bladder cancer service there, and, and I run multiple clinical trials. And uh, there are a lot of agents that we're looking at in the pipeline. There's TRC-105, which is an anti-androgenic agent. There's lenalidomide, which is also an anti-androgenic agent, but it also modulates the immune system. So we're learning more about how it works in solid tumors. It's currently FDA-approved for blood tumors. Um, XL184, or cabozantinin, which is a dual target. It targets androgenesis, but it also targets the CMED pathway. And I think that's where we're headed, is into uh, multiple targeted drugs uh, right now. And uh, an anti-PSCA. So over the last two years of genomic-wide association studies, we have uh, found 11 signals in the germline and, and that you can inherit that predispose you uh, to bladder cancer. And uh, one of these uh, is, is PSCA. Uh, we, there's actually a drug available for it, so it would be interesting to test that. So that's a, a study that we're designing right now uh, at the NCI. So in summary, Cancer is caused by errors in DNA, and understanding cancer genetics will help improve cancer treatments. The TCGA is an important effort that will help in our understanding of cancer genetics. Bladder cancer is one of the 20 tumors that will be studied through the TCGA. We have made many advances in targeted therapies in multiple cancer types, but there is an unmet need of new effective therapies beyond chemotherapy in bladder cancer. Multiple targeted therapies are being studied in bladder cancer, but we still need a better understanding of the biology in order to move forward with effective therapies. Thank you.